Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. And I will admit that as I was reading the passage this morning in final preparation for this morning's time of meditation, it didn't feel right. It didn't sound right. And then I realized I was reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, not 1. So once I got to 1 Corinthians, boy, it all clicked and made sense again. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we are we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if an ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this, but God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now, if, now you are the body of Christ, individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. All are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for greater things, and I will still show you a more excellent way. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. I have probably preached and taught this passage probably 25 times to this point through my 20 years of ministry. And in studies that I've read and in studies that I've led, a lot of times this gets talked about as how we should organize ourselves, how we should prioritize ourselves, how we should recognize what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. But nowhere have I found someone who took the time to explain the phrase, body of Christ. When you hear those three words put together, what images come to mind? I am actually asking you to respond to that question. What are some of the things that come to your mind when you hear the word body of Christ? Christ on the cross. Christ on the cross? What else? Body of the, the body of the church. Okay. So, something like this. Okay. I was so thankful I didn't lose this in my flood. And as the body of the church, if it works, nope, the love bulbs burnt out. We are to be a light into the community. What other images do we have and ideas as the body of Christ? Puzzle pieces making one whole. So many parts come together. And Paul talks about the physical anatomy of an individual. Okay, 
This is a sketching dummy. It belongs to my son. He can articulate it in various shapes and fashions. And then he then draws the image and then gives it characteristics and clothing. Here, we'll have it waving high to you. One members, many a body. What else? What else do we think of when we hear the body of Christ? Community? Communion. You mean coming together? Are you talking about the bread? Oh, cool. This is my body. What do those mean? No, I'm being rhetorical. When Paul uttered these words about the body of Christ, the book of Corinthians was written before any of the Gospels had been written yet. So Paul was the first one who really put the phrase to paper. But it is based on the memory, the teaching of when Jesus instituted communion at that upper room and the Last Supper on the night that he was betrayed, where he took a loaf and broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. This was a powerful, powerful image to the Jewish New Testament world. Because if you go throughout the Old Testament and you study the Hebrew language in which the scrolls are written in, there is no word for body. There is no word for body. When we think of the body, we, as what it means to the church, we think of the church itself, we think of many members all put together. That's Pauline thinking. But in the Old Testament, when you talked about a body, you did not talk about it in a singular sense, unless you were talking about a dead corpse or a slave. Someone who is meant to serve the will of their master, their owner. They had no identity. They had no personality. They had no thing that made them special. They were just a lump of mass, either in lifeless form or in mindless form. Slaves were not meant to think, just to do what they were told. So when Jesus in that upper room said, this is my body broken for you, you have the master, the savior, literally lowering themselves, breaking themselves. I'll vacuum that later. So that everyone could partake and not only be one with Jesus, but be one with God as well. Then we scroll ahead to the time of Paul. And Paul, not only was Paul a Pharisee among Pharisees, which I interpret along the ideas is there was a part of him that was a bit disgusted with how the Jewish faith was unfolding. There was this idea of using it a means of advancing oneself, not striving to live and be close to God. Paul lived to be close to God. I mean, he did terrible things before his conversion. He persecuted Christians. He went to synagogues and tried to clean them out and get them focused so they would get back to what it meant to be a Jew, a chosen person of God, holy and righteous and acceptable, beautiful and loving, all in accordance with the teachings and the guidance and the presence of the divine. Well, he didn't know until Jesus literally knocked him off his horse in the vision was that he was getting in the way of God's plan. And when he did this, he woke up. He had an epiphany. He had an enlightenment. He had an aha moment. And he didn't just slough it off and go, eh, 
it rattled him to the core and he paid attention because he recognized this was God doing something. So he began to learn and he began to wonder and he began to ask questions. He went to the house of Barnabas where he was baptized. And he came to understand that God is bigger than the Jewish faith. God had fulfilled his covenant by sending the Messiah, his son, into the world to save the world. But he also recognized how God was now no longer singular to a particular set of people. You see, in the Old Testament, in the Jewish faith, there is this underlying it's almost a self-importance. You can convert to Judaism, but you're never going to be a real Jew. In fact, in some of your more conservative sects of the Jewish faith, that mindset still persists today. Um, you had to be able to be born into the faith, and you had to be able to trace your bloodline back to Abraham, the one whom God made the initial promise to. Be able to track your descendants back to the original of the originator of your progeny to be able to say, that's how I am a chosen person of God. I am a descendant of Abraham. God talked to Abraham, gave him a blessing. Therefore, through all the countless generations, it still falls upon me. Every time Jesus and Paul say, don't count on the fact that you are a son of Abraham, guaranteeing you getting into the kingdom, that's what they're talking about. They had a singular mindset. That was their fixation. And the laws were there to help them keep the boundaries of the relationship from their perspective, but they just seemed to be keep adding interpretation after interpretation after interpretation. And in some of the places where the laws, it became so perverted, it was very hard to see God involved, God present, God starting it. It's almost the whisper of a thought. But they were Jews. They were the only people chosen by God. And when God sent his son into the world, he didn't merely break the barrier of that mindset. He obliterated it. Because not everybody's the same. I'm sorry, but I'm the only one in this room who's as good looking as I am. And that's a very good thing, because I have a wonderful face for radio. Thank you, Al. <laughs> While I look at my hands, and I see my mother's hands, I see how my little fingers curve, I see the pattern of how the hair grows on them, I see some of the swollenness that's happening within my joints that she had. Now, I have scars in different places than she does, but I've had different experiences with them, but... I see my mother's hands every time I look at them. But when I grab something, I feel my father's strength of my hands within them. My father had very, very strong hands. He could take a simple player of wire cutters and clip through a cable the diameter of my thumb. His hands were a vice. And I feel that when I grab things. But I am the only one that's me. A number of years ago, we were zipping along in, in, in our minivan, driving back from someplace where we had spent a weekend, and my son says, Dad, what color am I? My wife is sitting next to me, who we all know she is from India. She is not fair-skinned like I am. And she starts blithering and babbling. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, all right, where's he going with this? So I say, just a minute, dear, i got a question. Well, Avi, what color do you think you are? He says, well, I think I'm both brown and white. And I said, really? Oh, I need to mention that this was in the middle of summer when this took place. I went, okay, why do you think you're both colors? And he says, well, my back is brown and my butt's white. He was talking about his tan line. <laughs> he grew up in a house where race wasn't an issue. Foreign cultures coming together was normal. But he lives in a society and goes to a school where that's not normal. 
but he's reflecting the diversity of the body. Many members, many cultures, many places, many individuals, all created and formulated in the image of God. Called to fulfill coming into a relationship with God. All with the individual relate, all with the individual calling to be filled with the Spirit, to come together and make our congregations. So here's where our human arrogance kicks in. When we talk about the body of Christ, broken for us, a gathered group of believers who are made up of many individuals, we don't always think about it on a global scale. We think about it on an individual congregational scale. We think about what we, people of Bethany, are doing. But let me let you in on a secret. Right now, there are two other churches within walking distance, a good stretch of the legs, doing the same thing we're doing right now. Within a 50-mile radius, there are another 250 churches doing the exact same thing that we are doing. In the tri-county area, you have about 14,000. In the state, in the country, in the world, let's just say the eastern time zone alone, you have thousands of churches that are gathering on a time of Sabbath, a time of set aside, make room for God, focus in the Spirit, see what we're doing, rest, get recharged, to face the week, all doing the same thing, connecting. But sometimes we only think about ourselves, because that's what we're taught. We ourselves are struggling as a body. Well, I talk to other pastors, I talk to colleagues, I talk to friends, I read articles. Every church, in one way or another, is struggling. We talk about how we're struggling to make the gospel relevant to people who have no concept of what it means to be in a church. Something that's natural to us but foreign to them. We're not the only ones. But we wonder why not all of our family members understand and want to be part of this thing called faith, be part of a body. If it's not this one, then, this one, then somewhere at least. And we're not the only ones. Now, what you think about when Paul talks about the body, well, instead of having it be a hand and a, upper, a lower arm and an upper arm and a head and a torso, Bethany Church, the Methodist Church down the road, the non-denominational, the place that's still serving and the place that you moved out of, every part doesn't become just a member of the human body becomes a member of Jesus' body. And we call that body the kingdom. The kingdom where we should be able to feel the presence of the Spirit move wherever we go into. But what we forget, and what we get fixated on, and what we get focused in is our struggles how we weren't what we once were 25, 30 years ago. That we can't do what we used to do. It's interesting. I use the analogy of my mother's hands. Well, as my mother grew older, I watched those dark hairs turn into gray ones. My son's favorite pastime to annoy me is to sit there and count the gray hairs sprouting in my beard. I've made no secret of this. Now he noticed some in my temples, and I went, yeah, but the great thing about my hair color is i got to have a boatload of them before everyone sees them. I got that from my mother. Thanks, Mom. We look at it just individually. Either we ourselves, the Almighty Me, or we ourselves is one collective body. And you want to know something? While each church is given an individualized mission and calling, that calling and vision is to do the exact same thing, grow and share God's kingdom with the world. How are we doing it that's unique, that's not copycatting someone else, that is following what God is calling us to do so we can see and experience greater things? The answer to that comes down to 
what is it in our faith that we focus on? The body of Christ as a gift that should be shared for all of us? The body of Christ that is contained and emanated within four walls? The body of Christ that can be interpreted as just ourselves as a single body or a body that's connected with the world? You see, there's no one singular definition or explanation for that term body of Christ. It has multiple applications. And in our faith, in our struggle, in our journey, in our growth, we are constantly and consistently flipping back and forth between these. And there's probably many other degrees in between that I haven't thought of, but these are the top three that came to mind this week. Not one is better. Not one is worse. They are all equal. Which means we need to allow ourselves to be working within all of these. Seeing how does the body of Christ feed and send the body of Christ so that other people become part of the body. How do other body ask questions of the body so they can come to Jesus? That is ministry. That is walking by faith, not by sight. That is fulfilling the great commission to go into the world and make disciples. That is simply living our faith each and every day as the body of Christ. Would you all pray with me, please? Help us to wrestle, God. Help us to grow, O God. Help us to serve you and serve others. So as our body struggles, O God, We invite others to join us, for in that struggle, the thing that we see is you calling us, guiding us, filling us, healing us, and making us whole, because you sent your son Jesus into this world. We are here, God. Use us in accordance to your will for your body. Amen. The body can mean a number of different things, both separately and together. It's a both and, and that's something that kind of defies our logic. Because we have this idea that only one thing can be one thing at a time. Physics teaches us that two objects cannot occupy the same body or the same space. Teacher, the scriptures teach us that we can't serve two masters. That's almost Newtonian in itself, a reversal of two bodies in one space. You can't have yourself pulled in two different directions. But if God can be both here and in the heavens at the same time, why can't his body be all three of these? We just still have to allow ourselves to weave in and out of them to work in the place that we're put at the time, and then as it changes and we're called to move on, we move with it. Because that's the beauty and wonder of how God works and unfolds. So let's enjoy it and let the greater things unfold. As you go from this place, take what you've heard. Think about it. Pray about it. And if the Spirit calls you to, apply some of it to your lives. But as you all go from this place, do not be afraid to let the world know that You all are children of God. Go in grace, be filled with his peace. Have a great week, everybody. Amen.